Hello and welcome to the channel. Today I'm doing a video introducing you to philosophy through an introduction to Plato and the Platonic Dialogues. But you've probably been introduced to both of these topics before, so I am going to reintroduce you to them. There have been a lot of videos made that introduce people to Plato and Platonism, but none of them really introduce the listener to the Platonic Dialogues, and that is really what I want to cover in this video today. So if you are interested in studying Plato or studying philosophy, then this video is perfect for you. Why should you start with Plato? Because for the most part, he's the beginning in terms of complete writings. We don't have complete writings of anyone really before him. Uh, Thales, Pythagoras, Empedocles, etc. We don't really have complete writings. We have fragments. And so it's generally agreed that Plato is kind of the beginning of philosophy, and Plato has an immense amount of writings. He has 45 total dialogues and other writings. In the Hackett Complete works that I will be using as a reference to make this video, he has 34 dialogues plus 11 letters. Of course, some of these are disputed, uh, but still, I am going to include them in the number. Continuing on, Plato is fun to read. There's uh, jokes and other witty banter in the dialogues, and some people read him for fun sometimes, not even to study philosophy. Another reason to study Plato is that Plato is the only philosopher who provides the training for being a philosopher and doing proper philosophy. And so most people don't really know that, and so I really want to emphasize that topic in this video today. Also, Plato makes it explicitly clear that to be a proper philosopher means to change our lifestyle based on the ideology we identify with. So essentially what this means is that you don't have to change your lifestyle to study Plato, but it is of course encouraged to get the full effect. Um, what this means is that a lot of people present this study as a purely intellectual activity, and that is really not what this is. Plato is very clear throughout the dialogues that this is practical. This is something that we're supposed to be doing with our life. We're supposed to be uh, putting this these ideas into practical application in our lifestyle. And so I'm, I'm going to make sure to teach it from that perspective, and then you can do what you will with that information. One of the other amazing things that uh, is why we should study Plato is because Plato is the great synthesizer, in my perspective. He synthesizes the history of Athens, the Greek culture, uh, the Greek religion, the poets, the Orphic and Eleusinian mystery schools, the Pythagorean mystery schools of math, music, and memory permeate the dialogue, of course, Socrates and Socratic philosophy, as well as the pre-Socratics, such as Heraclitus, uh, the Logos doctrine, uh, the doctrine that everything is change, uh, Parmenides, we have the uh, doctrine that everything is oneness and unity, as well as everything is um, permanent and eternal, nothing changes, as well as the one many problem. And then Empedocles, we get the four elements, as well as uh, the sophists. We have the uh, subjectivist philosophy being represented in, in the dialogue. So we see a whole bunch of different ideas, even other things like the Persian Magi. Uh, we have dream interpretation and other things that are uh, mentions to be influenced by them, as well as the Egyptian mystery school teachings uh, a couple times in the dialogues. Um, the quickest reference is the Atlantis myth in the Timaeus and the Critias. And then um, most importantly, you will be introduced to the central projects of philosophy because really anyone who comes after Plato is working on the same projects of epistemology, ethics, politics, uh, psychology, etc. that uh, Plato is working on. For example, Aristotle responds to Plato, and then uh, the subsequent philosophers uh, respond to Ar Aristotle and Plato, and then continuing on uh, down uh, the line as uh, more philosophers respond to the people in their past, and there uh, we generate the projects of philosophy that everybody is working on. So to really understand what these projects are, you have to start at the beginning. 
So I made these next two slides for those people who are looking for their next platonic dialogue and would like to survey the summary of each dialogue so they can possibly uh, jump into one. So just go ahead and pause the video for this slide and then the next one. Uh, the next one has the more esoteric dialogues. This slide has the sophists and the ethical dialogues as well as the uh, trial dialogues. I will get into which dialogues I recommend reading at the end of the video. And so this one has the more esoteric dialogues and I will actually be making a part two to this video so that I can go over the esoteric aspects of Plato and Plato's philosophy. Now for one of the most important aspects of this video, the philosopher training. This is not the same training that the philosopher is given in the Republic and the Parmenides, and I am not going to talk about that in this video. I'm just going to talk about the most basic training that a person needs to do proper philosophy and to be a proper philosopher. Because as we all understand it, to do something proficiently, you need to get training for it. If you want to drive a car, what do you need? Got to get training. If you want a job, what do you need? Got to get training. And then once you have this training, you can approach any philosopher or any subject, regardless of if it's philosophy specifically, and be able to master that subject much better than anyone else who doesn't have this training. Especially since, like I mentioned before, the philosophers build up each other's ideas. And so hopefully this will become apparent as we go through this list. As what Plato will be doing as you read the dialogues is helping you acquire a toolkit needed to do philosophy. One of the things that you will be doing is learning how to structure a coherent argument that can surpass scrutiny. This is very obvious as you're reading the dialogues that one of the things that uh, is being expressed is how to structure a coherent argument and what's going to happen when that argument is scrutinized as well as it teaches you to make distinctions in vocabulary and different ideologies, which is imperative in uh, doing philosophy. Also, you get introduced to concepts and terminology that you need to know, such as being, uh, the forms, epistemology, and ontology. Gotta learn these and all the other terms that philosophers use. Need these tools in your toolkit to do philosophy with other people, to have real philosophy conversations. And you'll notice that those people who have this training can do philosophy much more proficiently than those people who don't have this training. Another thing that the dialogues force you to do is they train you to go in depth and uh, put the pieces together as you have to puzzle through the dialogues. That's the whole point of this training. Um, Plato doesn't really tell you exactly what his ideas are. Uh, most other philosophers don't write in a dialogue form. They tell you exactly what they want you to think. Uh, Plato doesn't do that. Plato writes with a whole bunch of different characters sometimes. Sometimes there's like five or six characters who are all talking and you have to figure out which one of these ideas is really what we're trying to learn here or just learn them all, right? That's how I approach it. And you will inevitably answer these questions while you're reading. Uh, you're going to read this and then they're going to ask a question to the character, but you're going to answer it in your own mind. And that is another aspect of this training, uh, wandering while wondering. We're wandering through these ideas while we're wondering about them, trying to figure them out for ourselves, which is essentially what philosophy is all about. And so this trains you to understand arguments. This also trains you to follow trains of thought, to analyze arguments for legitimacy and so much more. Uh, I can spend all day talking about this stuff, but this is an intro to a uh, Plato video. So I really just want to introduce you to how important these dialogues are for the training of the philosopher and how many different aspects are incorporated into these dialogues to really give you that training. And the last thing I want to emphasize is that the goal of the Platonic project is to practice self-cultivation as seen from uh, first Alcibiades, Alcibiades, uh, Stephanus number 119b. All of this is for self-cultivation, uh, sometimes termed the development of the soul. The goal being complete mastery of the self 
because anyone who is not a master of their self is a slave to their passions or their desires. Um, and also see first Alcibiades, uh, one, uh, Stephanus number 122a. And this is also a major topic in the Gorgias. And so this project comes about only from knowing yourself as the Delphic Oracle inscription says. And so this philosophy training, it's about cultivating yourself. Really, if you go through this training, you'll realize that you have done some self-cultivation. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was if you haven't heard uh, what a Stephanus number is, it's the number next to the Platonic dialogues that we use to cite a specific passage in the dialogues. And so for the example that I just gave, what we see is these numbers here on the right. And so I just cited Stephanus number 122a. So you can go to the dialogue, first Alcibiades or first Alci Alcibiades, go to the Stephanus number 122a, and then look for the specific text that I referenced in this uh, specific instance, I referenced how um, it says, the justice man teaches him to be truthful his whole life long. The most self-controlled man teaches him to be mastered. Oh, okay. The most self-controlled man teaches him not to be mastered by even a single pleasure so that he can get accustomed to being a free man and a real king whose first duty is to rule himself, not to be a slave to himself. Here are the topics that I'm going to go over next. Uh, I didn't really put them in any particular order, um, but the first one is the dialectic. There are two types of dialectic. Um, the first one given in the Theotetus with the uh, philosophical midwifery. I'm going to briefly explain like the simplest form of that right now. And then um, the second form of dialectic as the training for the philosopher king in the Republic and the Parmenides. And so the simplest form of the dialectic is to have a conversation with someone to give birth to new ideas and judge these ideas uh, for their uh, worth. Essentially, should we act upon these ideas? Uh, we do this all the time. This is uh, very natural to humans to, it's literally something simple as getting feedback, right? You have an idea, you want to give birth to it. You essentially want to bring this idea to fruition. Uh, you're, you're having uh, trouble. You're not really sure. Um, you're in this uh, state of, of uh, anticipation. And uh, you're looking for some feedback to give birth to this idea. We do this uh, most commonly at work with our coworkers and with our friends um, when we're dealing with life situations. And so Plato kind of put a name on that. Uh, it's called uh, philosophical midwifery, and I just wanted to introduce you to the basic form of that idea of what the dialectic is, uh, just so that you can have that in your mind when you're reading the dialogues, because that is very important to really understand that. Um, the dialectic is having a conversation with someone to give birth to new ideas and to judge those ideas for their worth in terms of should we act upon them? Are they worthy births? Um, that's the term. So now let's discuss Plato's most popular theory, the theory of the forms. And so this will be just a basic introduction because just like the rest of the things in this video, it's really just to introduce you to these ideas so that you can understand them when moving through the dialogues. Because really in my perspective, when I read the dialogues, it kind of seemed like they had a presumption of knowledge. Like they kind of presumed that you had this knowledge before. And so I really want to give people this knowledge so that when they're reading the dialogues, they can get the most out of it on the first read and then maximize their reading ability in every future attempt. And so the simplest explanation for the forms is math, which is why uh, Plato uses it as um, that in the Mina. When you see a shape, uh, it's a form. Um, however, Plato really is concerned with more um, non-physical forms that are trans transcendent. And so I have three pictures here, uh, the Mona Lisa, the Van Gogh, and the Taj Mahal. Uh, picture one is beautiful, picture two is beautiful, and picture three is beautiful. Um, 
they don't have the same exact shape. Um, a woman is not the same thing as a building, is not the same thing as the scenery of a night sky. Uh, and so there is something that is giving all of these three completely different shapes, completely different physical forms, the same transcendent metaphysical form called beauty. And that is because there's a likeness between the forms. That's what uh, Plato is really interested in, is studying the forms and studying likeness and similitude. How are things like each other? How are things similar? And this comes up a lot, um, specifically with beauty. There's symmet symmetry, order, uh, and balance, and that's what really gives it beauty. Uh, Socrates explicitly talks about the forms in Stephanus number 6D and E in the Euthyphro, uh, as well as the uh, Mino. He talks about it in Stephanus number 72A. If you're looking for a specific instance to uh, reference and understand what I'm talking about. But really, for the rest of the dialogues, they presume that you understand what it means uh, for the forms. And also, because of the uh, essential metaphysical nature of the forms, uh, Plato thinks that we really meet the forms in the mind of God. And there is an excellent video that I will link in the description below in case you don't really understand what it means to uh, meet the forms in the mind of God. Uh, another important thing that you need to understand in terms of forms is the idea of participation. Uh, we can participate in one form or participate in another form. For example, uh, the same person can participate in health, they can be healthy, or that person can participate in um, disease or illness or being unhealthy. And so we uh, focus on the participation of the forms throughout the dialogues, and that's really important. Another very important aspect that needs to be emphasized when understanding the doctrine of the forms is that the forms have a perfecting power. When the forms work through something that participates in the form, it perfects that uh, nature of the thing participating in the form. And so to really give you an example of what that could entail, I quoted uh, Rene Descartes' uh, rule number four and rules for the direction of the mind, where he talks about how um, we need a method for finding truth. Uh, he talks about how in his day and age, the chemist, the geometrician, uh, etc., kind of like look for truth in this haphazard way where they're like wander seemingly like wandering the streets looking for, you know, someone who dropped gold in this, you know, non-systematic way. And so he really wants something to perfect these sciences, make chemistry uh, more perfect, make uh, geometry more uh, perfect. And that's really what we have when we have an idea in our mind we have, like, for example, the scientific method, what we do is we try and perfect these disciplines with this idea in our mind. And uh, we do the same thing when we're doing art, when uh, we're trying to do a painting or something similar, we keep going at it until we have that perfect idea in our minds. We uh, erase it if we possibly can, if we're not using something permanent, and go over it until we're perfecting it with our, our the idea in our mind. And that is the same thing that uh, Plato uh, wants us to look at, the perfecting power of the forms. It, when something participates in the form, the form has a perfecting power to it to make it um, more perfect. And so uh, that should really be taken into account when you're while reading the dialogues. And so the next thing that I wanted to briefly mention is the mean analogy, aka the doctrine of the logos. Um, although Plato mentions this in the Timaeus dialogue, Stephanus number 31c through 32, you can go ahead and read it here on the right. You can pause the video. He never actually says to use this to interpret the other dialogues. And because of that, it would fall under the topic of esotericism. And so it will be in the next video on the esoteric uh, introduction to Plato. But I wanted to briefly mention it because it is absolutely important um, in 
interpreting the dialogues, as well as I wanted to pique your interest for the next video. Also, another thing that I will be going more in depth in is, was uh, Plato a monotheist or a polytheist? I will give you a quick answer, and the simplest answer is he was a monotheist. Very clearly in the Timaeus uh, at uh, 40a, Stephanus number 40a, he talks about how the Demiurgos creates the other uh, pantheon of the polytheistic gods. So Plato is clearly a monotheist who has a monotheistic deity that creates um, other deities, uh, lesser deities in the hierarchy. And this hierarchy is actually explained in uh, Neoplatonic um, writings. If so if you're interested in the hierarchy, you should definitely go check out the Neoplatonic writings, and I'll mention um, secondary literature at the end of the video as well. Uh, last two things I wanted to mention is that Plato studies are a cognitive experience, so when you read Plato, you also have to study your own cognitive experience. For example, what does it feel like to experience courage? What does it feel like to experience the different aspects of love? And that's really imperative while reading the dialogues, otherwise you can't really compare your own experiences to what they're talking about. Uh, another thing that briefly needs to be mentioned is discovering an art of living, uh, a technique for living. Um, the word art uh, is usually translated from the Greek word techne. Uh, and so what does it mean to form a lifestyle around philosophy? This is the uh, main project of the dialogues is mostly they're about ethics and politics, but uh, I really want to make multiple videos talking about discovering an art of living specifically. And so um, just have this basic simple idea of it's about discovering a technique for living and just hold that in your mind while you're reading the dialogues along with all the other stuff that I've Topics I've covered in this video as all of these topics are something that you should build off of until you understand how in-depth we could go with all of these ideas. So moving on to the next uh, really important factor in the philosophy training uh, is what Plato has to say about what the difference between real knowledge is, false beliefs, and how those two differ from semblances of knowledge. Some people come to philosophy and use it to just justify their ideas that they already have. Uh, but very importantly, Plato teaches us to approach philosophy from the perspective that we need to remove our false beliefs and move from semblances of knowledge to real knowledge in the Platonic understanding. So let's go through what this really means. So, Due to the doctrine of remembrance that's in the Mino, Plato thinks that we all have this conception of the forms when uh, we are born, that we grow up with. This is why we think that we already know justice when we are young, for example, when he talks about that in the uh, first Alcibiades. And so because of these uh, logoi, or forms that we think we know intuitively. We think we already know what is true. We think we already know what is good. We think we already know what is beautiful. Uh, we don't need really someone else to tell us this because we intuitively understand this and we have something, idea, some kind of idea that's in uh, guiding us when we live our life. Uh, Plato would call that a semblance of knowledge uh, or that's what I'm actually going to term it because there are different ways to translate the terms as we're going to look at in the divided line. Uh, but that's because it's an imitation of knowledge, it's not real knowledge, and I'm going to get into what real knowledge is in a second. And so um, false beliefs, uh, pathologos as negative self images, uh, that's what the word pathologos means, it just means negative self images. And then um, misconceptions of knowledge gotten from society about the nature of reality. And that is also a uh, false belief. And so uh, one of the uh, perfect examples of a semblance of knowledge or a misconception of the good uh, in the Gorgias is with food. Uh, he talks about a bakery and uh, pastries. 
And so uh, we've all had uh, cake or donuts or some kind of pie or other pastry. And we know that or we think that they are good. And so Plato would say that that's not really good. Um, just because we think that it tastes good, uh, we actually know that it's not good for our health. And so Plato would say that's not the true good and beautiful. That is the transient good and beautiful. He actually gives his definition of truth uh, in the Timaeus uh, Stephanus number 28a, where he says that truth is something that always is. It's eternal. And um, everything else that is in the realm of change is merely opinion. And so in that regard, uh, what we're really looking at for real knowledge is something that is eternal. Um, whereas uh, false belief is something that is an uh, incorrect idea about reality. And a semblance of knowledge is something when we have a idea about that, but we can't really, um, it's not really knowledge yet. And uh, so one of the very important things that they do throughout the dialogues is define their terms so they don't have a misconception about the terms, so they don't have misconceptions of knowledge. And so uh, really quickly, let me give you uh, the definition of knowledge that I just uh, quickly uh, constructed for this video. Um, of course, it's a preliminary definition that you could build off of, or you don't even have to accept it. You can make your own. But once you understand what Plato really thinks knowledge is, you'll understand what I mean here. And so what knowledge really is, is uh, an individual must be aware of the parts of the ideas that they're expressing. They must be able to explain these ideas to another person, and they must have the ability to act on these judgments, these judgments that are considered knowledge with an aim at the truly good and beneficial because uh, Plato makes it clear that knowledge just can't have any um, random aim. It must have an aim at the, the what is truly good and uh, beneficial. And so uh, what that means is when we have a uh, semblance of, of knowledge, it's when we don't have um, the ability to do this yet. It's when we don't have the ability to communicate the parts to another person or act on this information. And I'll give you some examples and a, a little bit in the video. And so another thing that Plato um, makes clear is that real knowledge comes from within and is not determined by the collective. Uh, be a witness unto thyself to be convinced. Uh, so what that simply means is if someone gives you a claim of knowledge, they gives you a piece of information, you have to fact check it. And only when you fact check it, does it become knowledge. And when you convince yourself through this fact checking process, that's when you have real knowledge, according to Plato. So I just uh, think you should keep that in mind while going through the dialogues. And so... Really quickly, I wanted to uh, go through some examples from the Theotetus so that we should uh, understand exactly what he's talking about in terms of semblances of knowledge and false beliefs. But before I do that, I wanted to briefly summarize the main points of this slide that I want the listener to take away, as well as uh, reiterate uh, something. So the thing is that Plato recognizes that we have both semblances of knowledge, meaning we have intuitive ideas that have not uh, been fully grasped and worked through uh, by the individual. And we also have misconceptions of knowledge gotten from society about the nature of reality mixed in with all the other ideas that we call real knowledge. And so that's why the dialogues always start out with the, um, defining what's going on and the terms they're using and they're working through the ideas that we already know constantly throughout the dialogue in this uh, slow question and answer uh, process using logic. It's because Plato is really trying to help the reader work through all of the ideas that they've gotten uh, uh, slowly uh, using the methods that I mentioned throughout this video to help in the philosopher training. And so um, the main thing is to uh, go through this process and um, go in depth so that you don't have a semblance of knowledge, you have real knowledge. So let's move on to the 
the Atidas examples. So these are just quick examples that I wanted to show people in the dialogues so that they can understand exactly what I'm talking about. So the first one is that uh, Socrates says, yes, uh, because you are young, dear lad, and so you lend a ready ear to mob oratory and let it convince you. Uh, this would be a perfect example of misconceptions of knowledge that we got from society. Um, Another one would be uh, Socrates says, uh, we must keep uh, uh, helping our opponent in discussion to their feet again and point out to them only those of their slips which are due to themselves or to the intellectual society which they have previously frequented. And so to me, that's uh, such a great quote right there. Um, Plato's really trying to emphasize that we do get um, false beliefs. We get semblances of knowledge from uh, these uh, society that we uh, come from. And so we need to work through these. Uh, another perfect example, uh, he says, Sarti says, if we continue like this, Either we shall find what we are going out after, or we shall be less inclined to think we know things which we don't know at all. And even that would be a reward we could not fairly uh, be dissatisfied with. He's saying that uh, another process and another part of the dialogues is, you know, working towards, uh, you know, a state of not knowing you know, being okay with not knowing something because we're recognizing that we're not making false claims of knowledge. We're not uh, doing something like that that's, you know, uh, not really justified because we haven't worked through these ideas. Um, and then uh, the last one that I really want to highlight, uh, they use this in the Theotetus, um, is that uh, seeing someone from a distance and mistaking them to be another person. Uh, the example they say is uh, seeing someone from a distance and mistaking that it's Socrates. Uh, this is a perfect example of needing to go in depth for actual knowledge instead of having a misconception of knowledge or a semblance of knowledge from not examining something in depth. And so this is something I really wanna highlight is that to really make sure you don't have this semblance of knowledge that you can communicate your ideas to another person, you can act on this, uh, these judgments, you need to go in depth. And so um, that's very important. And the last thing I wanted to mention before we move on is that not only was this dialogue the perfect dialogue for the examples of what I wanted to talk about, because the Theotetus is a dialogue on uh, what is knowledge, um, but the entire dialogue, actually, if you're paying attention to what's going on, um, Socrates is examining a um, claim of knowledge that Theotetus got from Protagoras throughout the entire dialogue. So the, um, they're really examining this uh, misconception of knowledge gotten from society um, and, you know, the idea that uh, a man is the measure of all things and that knowledge is like perception uh, is really what they start out with. And so uh, that's what I wanted to highlight before I moved on, uh, because that is the perfect example of exactly what I'm trying to uh, express in terms of how Plato uh, does really, in my opinion, this uh, genius approach to philosophy and how he really uh, helps each person uh, go through these ideas. And so the next thing I wanted to briefly mention is the divided line. Uh, the divided line is in the Republic. I'm not really going to talk about it because this is an intro to the Plato video. Uh, but essentially what I wanted to mention is that um, Icesia, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, uh, is usually translated as imagination. Uh, pistis is translated as faith in the New Testament, uh, but we can translate it here as opinion. And then dianoia would be like analytical reasoning. And then noesis would be this like um, intuitive knowledge once we're like the master, because once you master something, you go beyond this analytical reasoning uh, to a more uh, perfect uh, intuitive knowledge. And so what you want to do, uh, what I was talking about before, is um, go from these false beliefs, if you have them, to semblances of knowledge, then to real knowledge, uh, then to wisdom. 
Uh, that's really how I understand it. And that's how I just wanted to briefly explain it so that you can keep this in the back of your mind when you're going through the dialogues, because it really does help to consider uh, what Plato thinks uh, uh, knowledge is and the process of going from uh, false beliefs to wisdom, uh, wisdom being um, a proficient knowledge. Uh, so once you have knowledge and you're proficient at using it, that's what I really think Plato uh, thinks wi wisdom is. And also, um, you're working towards unity. As you uh, work towards uh, wisdom, you're working towards universals. Because if you want to have a claim of knowledge, usually it's a claim of knowledge about universals. That is what truth is, especially in terms of Plato. And last thing is that this also includes uh, mystical experiences. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about this here because it's not the esoteric video, but it does include mystical experiences. And so... Um, one more thing before we before we move on to the next topic of justice so i really want you to take away from this video this very important difference between real knowledge and semblances of knowledge don't be satisfied with semblances of knowledge if you read a book if you watch a YouTube video, if you go to a seminar or a class or school and you cannot uh, explain to someone, you know, what you did, what you learned, um, if you're not aware of the parts and you cannot act on these judgments that you've made about this experience, then that's not real knowledge, right? Um, and so in that regard, don't settle for semblances of knowledge. Make sure to get real knowledge. And the only way to know if it's real knowledge is by going in depth. If you see flowers or fruit, or if you see a person, the only way to know if it's Im imitation flowers, imitation fruit, or mistaken identity is to get up close and personal. Examine it in depth. And that is really how philosophy is approached. And I want to make sure that you really understand that. I wanted to briefly mention uh, justice and what it means in the dialogues because they discuss justice throughout many of the dialogues, but Plato doesn't really give a real solid definition for it, except for in the Republic, which was uh, sometimes called on justice. And so um, in, just so you don't have to read the Republic to get that definition, to read the rest of the dialogues, I wanted to express something simple right here that you can build off of. Uh, <clears throat> justice means um, everything is working in a harmonious whole. All the parts are working together. For example, if we have a car. Plato says it's justice when everything works perfectly together uh, harmoniously. And uh, justice does not mean fairness when you're reading these dialogues. So I just wanted to make that clear. And uh, they discuss the one many problem consistently throughout the dialogues. And I think that this is uh, Plato's approach to the solution of the one many problem. How does the one relate to the many? Uh, how does the whole relate to the part? And this also goes into a holistic perspective in a particular perspective, zooming in and zooming out. I uh, just wanted to mention all of this really quick. And then um, also uh, identifying uh, parts to unify them into a whole argument. And um, music, math, and memory are required to make balanced, harmonious, truly good and beautiful people, because you will see that consistently throughout the dialogues. And I wanted to uh, remind you, pay, pay attention to all this stuff, okay? And so a uh, quick example of uh, the one many problem uh, that should be recognized when you're reading the dialogues uh, is an another example from the Theotetus. So I wanted to give all the viewers examples of exactly what I'm talking about when I say that uh, these ideas are continuously expressed throughout the dialogue, sometimes explicitly and sometimes implicitly. And so a perfect example comes from the Theotetus. Uh, Socrates asks, what is knowledge at the beginning of the dialogue? And then Theotetus says that knowledge is uh, a couple other things. Uh, and this is uh, right at the beginning. So he says it's geometry and other subjects enumerated uh, just now because he had enumerated them. I didn't quote them, uh, such as cobbling. Um, 
And then uh, Socrates responds, that is certainly a frank and indeed a generous answer, my dear lad. I asked for one thing and you have given me many. And so um, it doesn't say this ex explicitly, but it's dealing with the one many problem and how to unite all of these uh, ideas into a whole. Uh, and then uh, later on in the dialogue, uh, explicitly they do say that. Um, at Stephanus number 148D, Socrates says, you gave us a good lead now. Try to imitate your answer about the powers. Uh, there you brought together the many powers within a single form. Now I want in, you in the same way to give one single account of the many branches of knowledge. And this is really an example of um, how you should recognize while you're reading it that you're dealing with the one many problem and the, the solution to the one many problem. So the next thing I really wanted to cover was the sophists because there are a lot of dialogues on uh, the sophists and sophistry. And so essentially uh, the sophists really were in control of everything, uh, the poetry, uh, the laws, uh, they were the statesmen, um, all of this um, was them. And so I quoted the Protagoras right here where it says that the Protagoras says in the Protagoras dialogue uh, that the greatest part of a man's education is in to be command of poetry, which is um, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey actually says that there. Um, Nowadays, we use the term sophistry cons uh, consistently to mean uh, wise trickery and those kinds of people who present bad arguments in an intelligent manner to make them seem like good arguments. Um, but, you know, we should recognize that the sophists were the wise ones. Uh, they weren't like, you know, complete tricksters, but it is in some regards uh, that case, especially in these dialogues. And I really wanted to highlight that um, philosophy is a different approach to wisdom. That's why, you know, even though the sophists are called uh, the wise ones because sophist is, uh, you know, another word for Sophia, sophist, Sophia, wisdom, wise one, um, and Philo, Sophia, uh, lover of wisdom or friend of wisdom. Even though they're appro both approaching wisdom, they do it differently. And there's a reason that uh, philosophy culminated in, you know, Rene Descartes and David Hume, empiricism, rationalism, uh, science, and uh, sophistry did not. And sophistry is kind of considered this uh, other kind of like trickster ideology. It's because it, it really, uh, although again, there were a lot of really smart people and, you know, just because you were a sophist does, doesn't mean you were doing trickery. <clears throat> there, there, there was a different approach to uh, what they were doing with wisdom. And so the dialogues mention this a lot, and I just wanted to briefly uh, explain that to you so that you can understand why the sophist dialogues are worth reading if you weren't uh, considering them uh, worth reading before. So in conclusion, as we wrap up this video, I wanted to mention a few dialogues that I have uh, recommended. Uh, so personally, if you've never read Plato before, I would recommend reading uh, first Alcibiades or Alcibiades, um, and then also the Theotetus. Uh, they're kind of, the Theotetus is kind of a little bit longer, uh, something like six, uh, 60 to 80 pages is my translation, but uh, that's the um, complete works. And so if you, uh, depending upon what translation you get, it will change. Um, but don't let, you know, the size of the book scare you away. Uh, cause if that's really going to scare you away, then you shouldn't be doing philosophy. Uh, cause there are way bigger books out there. So, uh, I would really recommend, uh, the eye on the Mino, uh, the four gospel dialogues, the youth I fro, um, the Phaedo, the, um, credo and, uh, the apology. Uh, just to get a brief introduction. And then I would hit things like uh, the Gorgias and um, other things like the Symposium, you know, work your way up to the Republic and the Parmenia, Parmenides. I just included this uh, Neoplatonic curriculum just in case you were curious. Uh, kind of everybody agrees on the point that it, it doesn't really matter where you start because like I was really trying to express in this video, 
all the dialogues are weaved together in a way that they really presume that you understand what the other dialogues say. You're, so you're going to have to read all these dialogues multiple times. And so that's how I would really approach it. So as for the secondary literature, personally, I can't really recommend any uh, because that's not really doing the work. And um, essentially, the secondary literature presumes that you have a basic understanding of Plato. There's, there, I haven't found a secondary literature that does not presume that you have just like this most basic understanding. Um, <clears throat> And so the secondary literature that I actually read would be like Neoplatonic commentaries, for example, like Proclus. And so that's really what I choose. Also, Pierre Grimes, uh, Thomas Taylor, uh, other people like that who really understand the more esoteric side of Plato, because I think that if it's not esoteric, it's like a, an intentional misrepresentation. And I'll cover that in the next video. Um, which is why I really made this uh, two-part series. Uh, and so this uh, video and other videos, I'd say really replace most secondary literature and I would use them to kind of like read the dialogues, listen to the video, uh, contemplate the ideas as you reflect on them and then read them again and then continue this cycle uh, and then uh, add in some, you know, writing if you don't already. Uh, and then that'll help you uh, digest all the dialogues properly. Uh, which translation? I mean, that's really up to you. Which edition? That's really up to you. I recommend anthologies. Otherwise, it's kind of like a waste of money. I personally use the complete works of Plato and then I um, don't really use anything else. Um, I already showed you the recommended uh, reading order uh, for the Neoplatonists if you don't already have a curriculum. Uh, otherwise, like I said, just jump in, do whatever you want. Uh, but the uh, curriculum of study should really just be have a good grasp of the essential dialogues that uh, really make up Plato. And so those are the ones that I put on the previous screen. You can go back and pause that and look at those. And if you really understand those dialogues, you'll have the basic understanding of what Plato says. You don't really necessarily need to read the other ones, but they do help. I have read them. They do help a lot. So if you do want to be a master of Plato, read all of them. If you're just reading Plato to get a good grasp on philosophy, I would say read 10 to 15 dialogues. Once you understand those 10 to 15 dialogues, then go move on to say Aristotle or some other Platonist. Really depends upon what you want to do. But just to conclude, I want to make it clear, the philosopher training and the real knowledge versus the semblance of knowledge and the uh, false beliefs, those are really the main takeaways I want you to have from this video, as well as the fact that all of these ideas are really something that you need to continuously have your eye on as you're looking through the dialogues. And if you didn't get it on one go by watching the video, you know, I understand that because it's a lot. So that's why I was saying you can uh, use this video to kind of replace the secondary literature and to rewatch the video as you're rereading these dialogues to really catch all of these things and then make sure you're building on them as you're going through your philosopher training. The last thing I wanted to mention before I end the video is that I will be doing a part two of the intro to Plato series uh, to introduce people to esotericism. And if you don't know what esotericism is, then you should watch that video because it's perfect for you. I mentioned multiple things that I would uh, go over in that video. And uh, you really need to understand esotericism if you want to understand Plato because Plato is esotericism. He mentions the mysteries consistently throughout the dialogue. You should really understand what that means. He mentions myths all the time throughout the dialogue. You should understand why he does that. Uh, and so I will talk about all of that in uh, my videos. And if you like this video, uh, please like uh, and subscribe to the channel as I will be making more videos on Play Plato. And uh, also share the video to anyone you know who is interested in philosophy or interested in Plato. And I will see you next time.